Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette. Discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free. <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Welcome to episode 59 of Movie Oubliette, the hemisphere-spanning podcast for forgotten fantastical films with me, Conrad, celebrating my anniversary in Cambridge, UK. I don't know what that is. <laughs> and me, Dan, having severe snack cravings in lockdown in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, wow. We explore fantastic genre cinema, sci-fi, horror and fantasy because we love being woken up at 3am by a tall, pale stranger for some deep anal probing. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. Dan. <laughs> So, Dan, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. You know, lockdown life, mm. just got to hold tight. Snacking, piling on the pounds, are you? Oh, yeah. That's what Zoom's for. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know. It's tough. My vig anniversary, yeah. So it's one year it came oh, up on my Facebook. yeah, I get it. I get it now, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Exactly one year since after doing all of that prep for our Duncan Scars interview, I got addicted to his YouTube channel all about vegan cooking. And I did a Facebook post about how I went out and bought all vegan food for a week to see how it would go. Mm -hmm. And the answer is pretty well, still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have superpowers yet? No, don't think so. No, maybe they're in the mail. <laughs> Speaking of, mailbag. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we had a couple of responses to Krull this week. Beach Boy Nick, he was really excited about this episode. He was looking forward to it so much. And to prove it, he posted a picture of himself holding the Krull Blu-ray, wearing a Krull t-shirt. Wow. Which I thought was amazing and I was really jealous. I don't know where he got it from. Wow, that's an <laughs> avid fan right there. It is, yeah. I mean, he wasn't surrounded by Krull merch in his <laughs> Kroll man cave or anything like that. Yeah. But yeah. I expect the, a, a true Kroll fan to be in one of those um, Slayer get ups with one of those <laughs> laser staffs. Well, I don't think you can buy those, although I did discover that the guy who designed the Slayer outfits is the same guy who worked in Shepperton Studios and did the original Stormtrooper sculpts for the Stormtrooper uh -huh. costumes. Interesting. And he sells those on his website, so you can buy an original Stormtrooper outfit made from the original moulds for a cool couple thousand pounds, if you want one. That doesn't sound too <laughs> far-fetched for a true Star Wars fan. It doesn't, actually. I did look at it and think, hmm, I'm quite tempted, but then I thought, hmm, it's, it's a bit warm. I doubt that's a good outfit for the heat. <laughs> wow. It's funny, though, because that, that means there's another tie-in to Star Wars with Krell. Yes, there is, yeah, it's the same people. It's all the yeah. same guys in England that did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> so we also heard from Vamp After Dark after I posted a picture of a very, very young Todd Carty as one of the merry band of men that Colwyn takes up with in Kroll. And they said, Tucker forever, remembering the character Tucker Jenkins that he played for something like 13 years, I don't know, he was in Grange Hill, which was a long-running school-based TV show in the okay. UK. And he was such a popular character that he had his own spin-off series for three years. Okay. So, Tucker Jenkins, there you Great. go. <laughs> Didn't make it Didn't to make it New down Zealand under, or Australia. No. <laughs> no. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but Tucker forever, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great hearing from all of you listeners. So, Conrad, what are we doing today? Well, we're doing a film that I've never seen before. And we are very excited to welcome back returning guest, writer, editor and movie blogger, Isaac Sutton. Hey! hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me on again, y'all. <laughs> it's great to see you again. How are you doing? Not bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this movie was a trip, so I'm excited to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Where are you hailing from again, Isaac? 
I am currently living in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, our last guest is also from Chicago. So. Yeah, mm. Serge, right? I've yeah. never met him, yeah. but he seems like a cool guy. So. He oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should definitely take him out for lunch sometime. You guys would get on like a house on fire, I think. <laughs> never heard that expression before that's amazing <laughs> as long as you're wearing hazmat suits though true yeah, yeah two yeah. meters apart of course yeah. get my gas mask on yeah <laughs> <laughs> so how's lockdown been for you um you know i've been a lot of um catching up on <laughs> old anime <laughs> Ah, <laughs> There's been yes. a lot of, you know, just hanging around, doing a lot of editing work, right? I'm a freelance editor here in Chicago, uh-huh. so editing little graduation videos for people, editing YouTube content, just whatever I can get my hands on and hunkering down, trying to avoid the apocalypse. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. been, <laughs> been pretty okay. <laughs> That's good. So keeping busy and catching up on some things you haven't seen for a while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just watched, actually, uh, on y'all's recommendation, Death Becomes Her. Oh, Um, yeah. I was thoroughly charmed. Fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's charming for sure. So what have you got in store for us today? Because I believe you've chosen the movie for us. Do you want to uh, to go into the oubliette to fetch it for us? Sure, yeah, I'll do that. So it's just down this way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We've just installed a uh, security camera, actually, so we're just going to watch you on this monitor here. Yeah, we can give you directions. Great, great, okay. Man, it's really dark. Uh... Yeah, well, it's getting a bit staticky, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can't really see you. What's happening? <laughs> Isaac, are you okay? I stubbed my toe down here, and, you know, every time I... I try and curse an ancient Sumerian, you know, just out of general politeness, so. Okay. Oh, right. That explains. <laughs> yeah, I did find a movie, though. <laughs> All right. Oh, brilliant. Come on back. <laughs> I'm Dr. Abby Tyler. Okay. What do you have for us? <laughs> So I have with me The Fourth Kind, which is a pseudo documentary starring Mila Jovovich as Dr. Abigail Tyler. Uh, She plays a psychiatrist in Nome, Alaska, whose patients have all started to experience the exact same strange symptoms. Convinced that their psychosis has a connection to a number of disappearances in the area, as well as her husband's murder, Tyler goes down the rabbit hole of UFO abduction. What's real? What's fake? Decide for yourself by watching The Fourth Kind. Which we're Uh going to do. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Can't wait. (laughs) Back after the break. And we are back with Isaac, our good friend from Chicago, to talk The fourth kind, the 2009 real, in the quotation marks, movie. Uh, Isaac, you did choose this movie. What have you done? Um, (laughs) So the backstory behind this movie is it's a personal kind of thing, right? Okay. I fully recognized that when I suggested it, this is not a quality movie by <laughs> most stretches of the imagination. But when I watched it, I was very young. It was one of my first ever horror movies. Me and my friend were in a sleepover and we popped this thing in and we just had an absolute blast. <laughs> you know, not because it was scary. It's such a peculiar movie. It's so weird and just at points nonsensical. Like <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes you need stuff like that in your life. You know, you need just a touch of the absurd mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, to get you through the day. I'm sure a lot of people worked very hard on this movie. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people really put their time and love and passion into it. I really do think that. But sometimes you can learn a lot from that. You know, sometimes you fail so hard. Mm-hmm. That there's a lot to learn from. So I'm excited <laughs> to talk about it with you guys. Yeah. I mean, this film totes itself as being like based on true events. It's got archive footage, so it's like it's pseudo documentary slash found footage movie. Yeah. But it's not at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. It's all fake. 
my theory <laughs> is this came out right around like the paranormal activity boom where mm. like all these found footage movies start coming out, mm-hmm, right? It's mm-hmm. like Blair Witch kind of popularized the genre, quote unquote. Sure. And then Paranormal Activity made it like a thing that was okay to just make all the time and not a gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's been a couple of interesting movies, in my opinion, that have come out from that. I really liked Chronicle, oh, um, yeah, for too. example. But most of them are just kind of like excuses to just low budget it up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I think that's kind of what you have with the fourth kind in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, yes and no, though, because it's intercut with what I would call reenactments yeah. of the scenes, but then played side by side. So... <laughs> <laughs> but the but the actual archive footage itself is not real, so it's like reenactments of a fake scene. Yeah. So it kind of invalidates itself. It's like, well, what's the point here? Like, you filmed the original archive footage in quotation marks. So I'm not impressed. Yeah. <laughs> by your attention to detail. Yeah, it's it's such a close reenactment. It's almost like they filmed them on the same day. Um, <laughs> It's sort of trying to have its cake and eat it because it's got the dramatization that sort of makes the archive footage more realistic in a way because the dramatization is so bad and the dialogue is so terrible. Yeah. But at the same time, you're undermining your dramatization because you keep split screening and cross cutting with the archive footage when it's getting really tense, yeah. which completely breaks all of the tension because yeah. you don't know where you're supposed to be looking. It is truly bizarre. The way they open this movie uh-huh. is insane i can't believe they actually did it so (laughs) please describe it for us isaac it's wonderful i've got a description of what it reminds me of but i'll get to that Mm -hmm. okay okay Mm -hmm. so the lead actress (laughs) walks straight and looks dead into the camera behind her is this terrible green screen still image of like a forest somewhere Mm -hmm. not alaska definitely doesn't look like alaska Mm -hmm. despite everyone saying that's where the movie (laughs) takes place she introduces herself as the lead actress of the film that you're currently watching playing a fictional character who doesn't exist but is trying to paint it as a real character and as she's doing this her audio cuts off at the end of her sentence in such an awkward way. I know. Yes, she's it's like jump cuts. Jumps yeah. all over herself. And I forgot to say this, which this is truly the cream of this whole sequence. She's spinning around in a circle. Oh, so much spinning. She yeah. does this. It's like a fever dream. I can't believe what I'm witnessing. And I think that they thought it would be scary, but it's just so off-putting that it's like I think they messed up yeah. <laughs> like they, they messed up yeah. shall I tell oh. you what it reminds me of yes yes please do <laughs> because she walks out of this extreme out of focus blur of forests that are glowing behind her it just reminded me of the Springfield Files episode of The Simpsons oh. where Mr. Burns comes staggering out of the woods with his eyes wide oh and goes yeah. I bring you peace <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for her to say, I'm Mila Jovovich, I bring you peace. <laughs> <laughs> But that's oh, quite man. apt because that episode is a rip-off of The X-Files. X-Files yeah. And it has to be said, this film really is riding in the wake of The X-Files mm-hmm. very much, mm-hmm. I think. A hundred percent, yeah. This film also reminds me a lot of all of those real crime investigation shows, <laughs> Unsolved Murders, where it's <laughs> where instead of walking out of the light, they're walking out of the darkness. It's like, hi, I'm some big-name <laughs> presenter and these are all real stories. Mm. This is like one of those shows but the reenactments in those shows are always ridiculously overacted and dramatic and because of that sort of style it made a lot of the scenes in this movie seem ridiculously overacted yeah way too stylized as well way too polished heaps of weird filters everywhere and constant music 
Like, mm. There's like two moments in the whole film where it's like, oh, yay, a breath. Oh, no, there's a the music again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just constant moody pads and atmosphere that really distract yeah. from the movie. And also it's like they're distracting, but it's like doing nothing. Yes, <laughs> there's yeah. so many choices that are just nothing. This is a non-choice. Yeah. This is just something you <laughs> threw on. Okay, so why is this movie set in Nome, Alaska? <laughs> Period. They don't utilize the fact that they can only fly into Nome, Alaska, which is that true? That no. feels like a falsehood. <laughs> no, it's yeah. not true. It's not... They're not surrounded by mountains at all. It's oh, really? Like, <laughs> no, they have no trees over the height of four feet, apparently, because it's like this barren wasteland. Oh, right. So it's bullshit. <laughs> Everybody that lives in Nome, Alaska is watching this movie like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and they say Nome, Alaska so much that you think, okay, well, they surely are, like, doing this for realism. Mm. The other thing about this movie, it just wears so many hats. Mm. So there's hypnotherapy, mm, right, yeah. which they basically act like is just straight-up real science. Yep. There is the alien abduction angle of it, which is like, okay, duh, that's what this movie is about. <laughs> there's this weird family drama that makes no sense Mm. (laughs) her son the son of the psychiatrist hates his mom and her daughter is blind but not really blind she has a psychosis that makes her think she's blind yeah (laughs) and they don't really do anything with it other than show that she has kids so they can later take them away from her and i'm like why does her son hate her so much (laughs) i really don't know (laughs) i did notice in this film as well like it's predominantly male characters Mm. with the obvious exception of Mila jovovich's character and her daughter and they're just constantly telling her, oh, you're crazy. And it really irked me. Like, there was no sort of, like, comeuppance, really. It was just, like, a bit of a downer the whole way through with, like, a downer ending. And oh, yeah. I don't know. It just didn't seem quite balanced in terms of gender roles, I guess. The no. way that this movie treats its lead character is wild. Mm. But beyond that... She has nothing to her. She is of no substance because between the real footage and the reenacted footage, they're like completely different people. Yeah, I know. I know. (laughs) The casting (laughs) makes zero sense. It's like, I would like Tom Cruise to play me. Thank you. All right. The most unlikely, not even similar in looks actor to play a character. It's ridiculous. It's wild the casting choices in the movie are wild and also the direction between these performances are wild because in all the reenacted footage she's like determined at points or like strong or like they're trying to pass her off as smart or like whatever and then in all of the vhs low quality footage <laughs> she's literally just weeping yeah. she like cannot <laughs> even get a word out I she know. has nothing to her but sadness it's so weird and i think they're trying to like at some point do that as a reveal like and then she just turned into a sadness monster at the very end of the film <laughs> <laughs> it like doesn't come across at all. Yeah, it is yeah. so weird. I don't like ragging on things. Just you know, let's just trash the fourth kind for an hour. But yeah. can I just say how much I fucking hate? the real quote-unquote Abby Tyler's singy-songy voice in all of those archival footage interview mm. pieces. Oh, God. oh, she's the only thing I have <laughs> Oh, for goodness sake. And that is a British actress. Her name is Charlotte Milchard. Mm-hmm. She's obviously not credited in the movie as Dr. Abby Tyler because they didn't want to give the game away. She's credited as Gnome Resident. <laughs> but she is credited. And she's a fine actress. She's been in lots of other things and she's really good and she doesn't talk like that at all so she was directed to perform that way or made that choice and the director didn't say actually for a whole hour that's really irritating yeah. <laughs> no she powers through all every line of dialogue in the same singy soggy voice <laughs> Thank you. 
I have to say the archive real footage is mostly uh, convincing. Yeah. Apart Except from, from those interviews. that interview with like Chapman University. Yeah. What? What? <laughs> why is it Chapman? Uh, well, I know why it's <laughs> why? Chapman. It's because it's the director's alma mater. So it's it's oh. Olatunde Osunsanni. Oh, I'm butchering that. I'm so sorry. And he plays the interviewer. Right. I'll be kind and say his direction is possibly better than his acting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that was kind or not. <laughs> no, it's probably damning with faint praise, let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. <laughs> what is going on with her look, though? She looks like a ghost. Yeah. Like, they just made her up to be a scary ghost. <laughs> but she's on the show. <laughs> I don't understand. She looks like she's rolled in mud and got her clothes from like the garden or something. It doesn't. If they were filming that, they wouldn't have her dressed like that. What is going on? Yeah, those Ugh. scenes are terrible. But you're right. The footage of the things that are happening. I mean, the actors that are in those reconstructed hypnotism scenes, they fully commit. Yeah. And the use of static. You know, they use the static to sort of cover up the primitive special effects. Mm. That old Naughty's favourite, the elongating mouths. Mm. Mm. The bit mm. where the mm. guy sits bolt upright and floats with his mouth yawning open while he's screaming <laughs> ancient Sumerian. Yeah. It's pretty disturbing. I found it pretty disturbing. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's disturbing as long as you're not thinking about it too hard. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, the static was good, I guess, but so frustrating. Mm. Like, oh. The movie's about to get... Oh, no. Yeah. No, it's not good because all I can see is static. Yeah. Great. My favourite of that is when the uh, UFO hovers over the Tyler household and you, it's, you just cut to static and you just hear the policeman in the background saying, wow, there's a beam of light and there's a kid floating through the window. And you think, shit, I'd like to see that. Come on. This is the climax of your movie. Show don't yeah. tell cinema, but no, yes. apparently not. <laughs> I will say as well, though, I do agree with y'all. I wish that this movie almost was like straight up shot with the cast that was in the archive footage and they just yeah. did it straight up like a... Found footage. 100% yeah, found footage. like a found footage. Mm -hmm. That would have been great. The scene that I thought was really disturbing was when the man holds his family hostage. Ah, uh, yes. The yes. thought of that in general is just truly disturbing. And I think in those moments, I can see like what they were trying to go for with this movie, right? It was like, there is something scary about the psychology behind UFO abductions sure. and knowing what is real and what is not real. And there is something terrifying about that that I think really hits home, at least for me, and like having your trauma come out and hurt people. That is a truly terrifying mm. concept. But when you handle it this clunkily, mm. it just doesn't come across. Yeah, I would say right. all of the sort of archive footage, like I wish it had just played it by itself. Like don't do the split screen comparing thing in wow, it's like, oh wow, it's so well reenacted when it's not. Like just play Play the archive footage, and that would have made the film so much better. If that shooting the family scene just as archive footage, that would have been a lot more disturbing. Yeah. But because it's intercut with like fake rain, the frames moving like crazy the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> The camera work, like, it seems so <laughs> obvious as well. Like, every time they wanted a more tense, gritty moment, <laughs> switch to handheld. It's like, oh, we're in handheld, so it must be tense and gritty. <laughs> like, it felt way too obvious. Yeah, and splitting the screen up like that, it really does divide your attention. I mean, even Brian De Palma abandoned that because he used to do it a lot. I mean, if you look at something like Carrie, the climax of that movie is all split screen. Yeah. It's an interesting way to try and carve up time because he's always trying to show you more from a single moment. Mm, mm, mm. But he found other ways of doing that, particularly with slow-mo. But in this movie, at some points, there are like five or six images on the screen playing at once. Yeah. And I don't know where I'm supposed to look. And yeah. as a result, I'm missing things and the tension's gone because the reality of the dramatization is suddenly punctured by the presence of this mm. real footage. Yeah. Even when they're trying to do it simply, mm. right? And it's just one 
one camera on the dramatization, one camera on the quote unquote real footage. Mm-hmm. All it did for me was I'm comparing these two performances now. Of course. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't just watch this and be like, oh, well, this half of this fake thing legitimizes the other half of this fake thing. That's yeah. not how that works. So at the end, you're just like, well, this guy's doing a lot better job than this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's wild that you would have reenacted footage of stuff that you have actually shot anyway, yeah. right? <laughs> like, if we're pretending like this is a real documentary. I mean, I think it's that fine line. You can't be too obvious because then it gives a game away that you obviously shot both scenes. <laughs> So, like, a simple thing is one scene, I think it's that Scott or Tommy is wearing a flannel shirt, but in the reenacted scene, he's not wearing a flannel shirt. It's like, it's not that hard to find a flannel shirt, guys. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just didn't watch the footage. <laughs> Yeah, I think what it's trying to do in some ways is overcome the problem that you always have in found footage movies, even in Blair Witch, which is probably the king or queen of found footage movies. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's the one that coined the phrase found footage because it's the only one in which the footage is literally found. But the problem always with those movies is why are they still filming? Of course. In Chronicle you kind of get away with it because they're experimenting and they're documenting their experiments with their superpowers and then towards the end you start getting a mixture of footage from all over the place so you kind of go along with it by that point Mm. but even in the Blair Witch you're wondering why are they still filming they should just be running for their lives why are they filming so in this movie you just get the bits that possibly would have been filmed and the rest of it is a dramatic reenactment so you kind of think okay that's a clever way of approaching it but yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> There's so many interesting ideas about this movie. It like desperately wants to be a good movie, mm. I think. Deep, deep down in its soul. It's trying to be. Yeah, yeah. it's really trying. <laughs> you want to root for it so bad. Yeah. Like, go, man, go. <laughs> but it just can't get there. And I think part of it is the inherent problems that we have already mentioned just with the visual style. But also part of it just comes from the plot is so hard to follow. Yeah, it's too much going on. It's yeah. so much going on. And they're trying to do so many things. And like, so for example, the owls, oh, yes. <laughs> right? Let's talk about the owls for a second. <laughs> In this movie, one of the problems that everybody has <laughs> is that they see owls, but they're not real owls. They're actually aliens <laughs> that come and visit them in the night. Mm-hmm. But we don't know that. They just kind of describe them as owls for most of the time, and they don't ever showcase why the aliens choose owls. Like, why are the owls significant in any way? It doesn't <laughs> explain it. In a movie that does go to such lengths to explain other aspects of alien like oh by the way the aliens are speaking ancient Sumerian because of history and we know this (laughs) as fact (laughs) because of thousands of years of research and anthropology I mean what it chooses to explain and what it doesn't choose to explain make it so difficult to understand what's going on yeah and that whole twist with what happened to Abby's husband I mean spoilers ahead people but He did not get killed by an intruder in their bedroom while he was in bed next to her. He shot himself in the head and killed himself. Now, first of all, I don't think this relates to the central story in any way. I don't think they're suggesting that it's because he was being abducted by aliens or whatever and he's suffering from post-traumatic stress. No, I don't Uh, think so. At least they never seem to suggest that that's what's behind it. But second of all, how does she delude herself into thinking that a gunshot wound to the head was actually an intruder in their bedroom? stabbing him to death in the chest. Mm. How did she manage to rewire that in her own brain? Why doesn't anybody call her on it? Mm. Her best friend is a psychiatrist and knows that she's delusional. Mm. And the sheriff, who's openly antagonistic towards her, never calls her on it, even though she keeps accusing him of not finding her husband's killer when he knows that there isn't one. And they let her carry on as a practicing hypnotherapist, hypnotizing people, and be a single mother of two very young children. Mm. What reality is this? I mean, the only time he calls her on it is right at the end of the movie. Loads of people have died. One of her children is missing. She's in a hospital bed and he chooses that precise 
precise moment to turn up, show her the autopsy photograph and say, oh, look, your husband killed himself. Yeah. Remember that? <laughs> I know. The biggest question of all of that, it's not like her delusion persists after that. He just has to show her the photo and she's cured. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so it's like, man, that photo would have been super helpful in the first act, my guy. Yeah. Like, wouldn't have that been great? Like the first time she has an argument with the sheriff where she's questioning, openly questioning his competence as a law enforcement officer yeah. on the grounds yeah. that he yeah. didn't find this imaginary killer. And he doesn't say, what are you talking about? Your husband committed suicide. Boom. Boom. Twist over. <laughs> but still, we have to have a twist, even though I saw it coming a mile off. And I also knew it didn't have anything to do with the plot. And it doesn't. It doesn't reveal <laughs> anything about her. It doesn't reveal anything about the central mystery. All it tells you is that everybody in this town is horrendously irresponsible. Yes. <laughs> and that she likes to reinforce delusions under hypnosis. Yeah. Which is a really great qualification for somebody who's a licensed hypnotherapist. Yeah. <sighs> So what happens to people when they get abducted? What like, because under hypnosis, suddenly they're just a conduit for communication from the aliens. They're just like a telephone for aliens, and they can talk to us. <laughs> it's Marion. Is that Wi-Fi hotspot? Is that, yeah. is that what they become? <laughs> this is the biggest question of this movie. Okay, so what is happening to the people in Nome, Alaska, right? Mm. What is happening to these people being abducted? And they never answer it ever, right? Which would be interesting if it was supposed to be like that. If it was like The Shining, where it's like the ambiguity is where the beauty of it is. Mm. But it's not. <laughs> because they <laughs> solve other mysteries. <laughs> like, you solve parts. <laughs> so you can't just leave this one central conceit of like what's actually happening to people up in the air like they just end up saying oh well you get abducted and i guess they like kind of torture you yeah. question mark they leave a little cut on your arm yeah. and then you go back down and then you're a telephone yeah like, <laughs> exactly oh they break your back as well for no reason yeah <laughs> they break your spine yeah like, why well this film is desperate to avoid the word alien and, uh, let's be honest i mean mm. they're really coy even when they're being hypnotized they come out with things like I'm being watched by an owl, but it's not really an owl. <laughs> and they're not from here. <laughs> you know, just say it's an alien. It's like um, the Dawn of the Dead remake where they're desperate to avoid the word zombie because they're ashamed of their own genre or something. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, why you don't just say aliens. I mean, at one point, Abby says to her psychiatrist friend, do you believe in abduction theories? Mm -hmm. And just leaves out the word alien. I so he gets know. confused. <laughs> what other theory? I mean, he goes, not like kidnappings. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> You mean what abduction theory would be about kidnappings? Come on. Yeah. So I did read somewhere when this film first came out, the residents of Nome were just astounded <laughs> at their portrayal of their town because there have been missing people in Nome, mm. but it wasn't from aliens. <laughs> and a lot of it has been attributed to alcoholism and just the harshness of the climate there. Yeah. If you get a little bit tipsy and wander off into the woods, you're probably going to die. So mm. also it is Alaska and apparently 51% of the population is indigenous and there's not a single indigenous <laughs> character in the entire film. Oh so no. bad portrayal there. And Melanie Edwards, the vice president of Kawarak, an organization representing the tribal people of Alaska, has said that this movie looks ridiculous and has described it as insensitive to family members of people who have gone missing in Nome over the years. So, yeah, yeah I would say accurate, right? Yeah. I've been looking back at The Blair Witch Project and you forget how much of a marketing coup that movie really was. I mean, this sure. is 1998, 99. Mm. The internet was young. They put up a website. They'd worked out a whole mythology. They put up missing posters for these three students who'd gotten lost in the woods. And, you know, a large tranche of people who went to see the movie 
thought it was real. Yes. Even afterwards, the sort of is it or isn't it was kind of fun, even when by the time it came to the UK, we all kind of knew that it was all just, you know, a bit of fun. Mm. But we still went and suspended disbelief and we're... I mean, I was scared shitless watching that movie on my own in a darkened theatre. They did well with the footage, though. It does actually look authentic. Mm. But crucially... It's not based on three real kids. I mean, they're using their real names and they didn't appear on Letterman the week the movie was released, but it wasn't based on a real case or anything like that. It was Mm. just kids go missing in woods. There was nothing particularly specific about it. Whereas this movie makes a very specific claim about Nome, Alaska and drudges up real statistics to try and back it up. Real statistics from genuine tragedy and co-opts them for, you know, a third-rate episode of The X-Files, not surprisingly, the residents were not pleased. No. And I don't blame them. They should have just made up a town. Yeah. 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 How hard would that have been? (laughs) How hard would that have been? So much of this is made up. Yeah. So much of it. Like... I think they did try and go for certain elements of realism. Of course, right? yeah. Like the quote-unquote fourth kind, that rating system that she rattles off in that fake interview, <laughs> that's a real rating system that UFOologists <laughs> have coined over the years mm. or whatever. And like, regardless of whether or not you think UFOs are garbage or not, people have real trauma attached to those things. Those are real people too. You know, people who feel like they've been abducted by aliens are real people. And I think they wrong the people of Nome, Alaska, but they're also, like, trivializing a lot of other people's stuff, too, Mm. right? Like, in general, the movie's pretty insensitive. I think it's pretty (laughs) easy to say that it's not a sensitive movie. It's not attuned to that. No, no, not at all. Uh, Going back to, like, the categories of UFO or alien sighting, I remember watching the trailer when this first came out, and they were going through all the, like, the first kind is this, and second kind is this. And I was like, wow, this movie looks amazing. It looks really, like, terrifying. I was excited to watch it, and then I forgot about it. <laughs> they had a really good premise, and I do think this movie is has the potential to be a really good movie, but yeah. oh, just totally unacceptable (laughs) execution. (laughs) I would have to say every single scene in this movie had something that just really irritated me. (laughs) That was just completely the wrong choice of acting out or framing or sound design. There's one scene where Abby's talking to, I think it was Abel after one of the crazy flip out hypnosis scenes and they're just discussing things. And then suddenly the receptionist barges in and says, oh my God, the tape, the tape, the tape you gave me. You have to listen to the tape. And they play the tape and the receptionist goes away. Yeah. Like She goes, I can't hear this. <laughs> she just dips. Was your role in that scene purely to deliver a plot point and then to leave the scene? Yeah. It just <laughs> pretty much. Why is she a character? Yeah. She does nothing. <laughs> they could have just played the tape. She could have played the tape and heard it herself. Yeah. Like what? I know. <laughs> Why a delivery system? Uh, tension I know. maybe? And she I don't runs know. in and says did you listen to this? <laughs> it's like, no, I asked you to transcribe it. I don't listen to myself. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> And the line delivery as well. I mean, on that fourth kind line, Abby, in her wonderful singy songy voice, says, There's nothing. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> me... You're going to nail it. Let me get my voice ready for this. All right, all right. <laughs> There's nothing more scary than the fourth because that's the one where they abduct you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, scary. No. The dialogue is terrible. I think (laughs) some of this dialogue is so on the nose that it is truly painful and it made me laugh out loud. Yeah. Easily my favorite, like, on the nose line (laughs) once they're at family dinner and Dr. Abigail Tyler is putting ketchup, I guess, on her daughter's meatballs. (laughs) Yeah. She's having this conversation with her son and the son's like, I have a game tomorrow. And the mom's like, oh, I forgot. Who are you playing against? And he goes, dad never forgot. (laughs) Harsh. Okay, That's really harsh. And also, like, you just want to tout the fact that, by the way, dad died. Don't you remember that, mom? Like, this happened two months ago. Like, wouldn't you still be sad about it? (laughs) Now it's time for Random Random. 
trivia. So, Dan, what trivia did an owl hoot at you when you spotted him late at night? <laughs> well, so my trivia is actually not about the film, but about the Close Encounters scale. So this was actually devised by the astronomer and UFO researcher J. Allen Hynek in his 1972 book, The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry. And so he, he does, he, he details the first kind of being sighting, the second being a, like a physical effect, and then the third kind obviously being contact. Uh, but he also details like, it's like a six-fold classification of UFO sightings. So he talks about nocturnal lights, daylight discs, and radar visuals. Um, so he really goes into depth, but that's the 70s. I didn't realise it was kind of... I guess, like, Close Encounters came out in the 70s, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that exactly. was kind of the height of it, wasn't it? I yeah. think J. Allen Hynek actually was a uh, consultant on Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think. Oh. I'm not positive on that. But... Yeah. No, you're right. He's in the movie. Oh, um, what? Right. <laughs> yes, he is. Right at the end of the movie when the aliens turn up, he's the man with the pipe that you see very briefly. Oh, right. Yeah. Did I know? So there you go. Yeah. Some extra trivia for you. <laughs> of a better movie. <laughs> yeah. Infinitely better movie. <laughs> no I matter mean, which of the three cuts you watch. <laughs> I did see that there is a fifth kind movie as well. So it's like <laughs> Oh wow. You can oh, go what? you can go from third and then just a giant step down and what I am assuming is another giant step down like you can take the full leap of garbage does it I mean does it get down to like you know like the 50th kind being like you know having a, a packed lunch with the alien like, <laughs> sharing a spa day <laughs> Oh, yeah. With a colonic irrigation, I guess, <laughs> rather than the anal probing. It's <laughs> traditional. <laughs> and that's our trivia. Yeah. <laughs> we should talk about these abductions because at one point, Mila Jovovich trots out the statistic. What is it that she says? 11 million people in the US have been abducted. 11 million people? Yeah, yeah. 11 million? No way that's real. It's not, no. no. So it just so happens that I'm reading a book uh, called The Science of Discworld, which was a collaboration between Terry Pratchett and the scientists Ian Stewart and Jack Cohen. And they touch on this. They say it's from a Roper poll in 1994, which supposedly revealed that one in 50 had experienced alien abduction, but actually, the number of people who specifically claimed that was zero. The pollsters used five symptoms of abduction instead, and anyone who scored sufficiently highly on the symptoms was deemed to have undergone an abduction experience. So the questions were things like, have you ever woken up paralysed with the sense of some strong presence in the room? Okay. Now, this is sleep paralysis. Mm. This is a well-documented experience that comes from our mammalian ancestry. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a feature of the mind that prevents sleeping people from moving their limbs around and acting out their dreams while they're asleep so that you don't attract predators or even just like get up and walk into their mouths. <laughs> Often when you wake up and this malfunctions and you're awake but your paralysis is still on, it's scary and sometimes people also get a sense that they're under threat, you know, that something is there and it's coming for them. And in the Middle Ages, they would think it was witches or succubi or something like that. But ever since 1977, when Close Encounters came out, it's been pale, tall aliens with almond-shaped heads and big black eyes. It's just Mm. everybody just fills that void in their imagination with this thing. Sure. And it always happens at 3.30 in the morning. It always happens at night. It's never at daytime in the middle of the town square. It's always when they're asleep. Mm -hmm. So it's quite clearly sleep paralysis. And it's a terrifying experience for people and a very real thing that's quite traumatising and difficult to sort of train their brain not to do to them every night. But... This film completely <laughs> boulderizes all of that and, right. and also misquotes the same poll to give a very false impression of just how rife alien abduction is in the US. Which, mm. If it were 11 million people, there'd hardly be anybody left. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, how much anal probing can aliens do? <laughs> yeah, seriously, at some point you just get bored. Surely. <laughs> Surely <you> <laughs> they do kind of imply that it is anal probing as well yeah. in this movie, yeah. which was such a, like, okay, whatever. We just didn't need that shot of her feet in way too exposed lighting. Mm. Like, we just didn't need yeah. it. Yeah, at first it just gives her a shoulder <laughs> tattoo, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, gosh. I have to say, I didn't like any of the characters. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's not a not single, a single likeable, likeable character. character. No. And there's no humanity at all in the movie. <laughs> Everyone's just so serious, and they're either unbelieving of Abigail or... Or they're being abducted. (laughs) There was no humour. There was no sense of a real human being being portrayed in this movie. You mean you don't like the sheriff? (laughs) It must be the most shining example of law enforcement ever committed to film. Not only does he storm into her house and accuse her of all kinds of things, then starts reading her Miranda rights without telling her exactly what he's arresting her for. Now, I I understand this isn't necessary in the US, in all states. It sort of varies. Mm. In the UK, you do have to be told, I'm arresting you on suspicion of. And I would just like him to have that sentence, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) I'm arresting you on suspicion of hypnotizing people into breaking their own backs? I don't know. It's so what, weird. What is she yeah, supposed why? to have done? Is, why would she be arrested at all? There were four witnesses <laughs> yeah. at yeah. this event. <laughs> Including a law enforcement officer. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, what are you talking about? You're going to arrest her for breaking this other dude's back. Why is she scared and like ready to run away anyway? Mm. They kind of imply that she feels like, oh, I'm going to get arrested. Because the cops call her house to... To basically say, by the way, we're coming to arrest you. And she's like, don't talk to him. Put him on hold. Take a message. As I like fill my knapsack with clothing. Like that yeah. series of events is truly bizarre. Mm. And I went through the painful moment of watching the deleted scenes oh. to see if it would explain any gaps. And it doesn't. Oh. There's nothing. That's just the way it was intended. Yeah. And Wowzers. Yeah. But this movie was on the blacklist. If you know what the blacklist is, essentially it's like this list of movies that producers from all over Hollywood agree, like, we really wanted to make this this year, but we couldn't, uh-huh. you know? <laughs> so this is hot property. This is one of the most exciting scripts we've ever read. Yeah. And if it's made, it will be a smash hit, but we can't get it off the ground. Right. I found it quite similar to the Mothman prophecies, sort of like some sort of entity that's been seen by all these people, and it's a mystery. Is it real? And that's all also supposedly based on a true story. Yeah. But it does it way better. And there's no found footage and (laughs) side-by-side comparisons. So you get immersed into the film. Whereas this, you never, ever, at any moment, got immersed in the film. It also stars uh, Will Patton, the sheriff in this. He is a very good actor. Yeah. Normally. Yeah, Yeah, I I looked up Will Patton's uh, other films, and he was also in a film called The Puppet Masters, which is another... (laughs) Alien Possession movie, I think. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, I remember with, it. They're like stingrays. That's right. They attach themselves <laughs> the back to of people's, people's brains. Heads. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. I've never actually seen it. Have you not? Oh, we should do that movie. <laughs> no. That's fun. Now, The Mothman Prophecies, I think, is a good comparison. That's 2002, directed by Mark Pellington. And I think this movie strives for that kind of visual style, too. Sure, Because yeah. you have sometimes these really slow, stylish, cutaway shots, sort of overhead shots, the close-up shots of the owls in minute detail that are in slow motion Mm. that are beautifully lit and plunging into darkness and then interspersed with that that kind of showy hideous stuff that happens in movies where the footage isn't particularly good so the editor tries to goose it up in the editing room by pressing all the presets on his shiny new digital Ah. editing software (laughs) so it's just hideous color grading (laughs) extreme zooms speed ramping and it's all happening at once it's the sort of thing you see on director video Mm. on demand Mm -hmm. streaming uh, horror movies film school in general yeah (laughs) just (laughs) press all the presets look how cool it looks and you think no 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 it doesn't yeah there was one effect that they used in the flashbacks that 
I don't know what I've ever seen before, but it looked terrible. Yeah. It was like shine flare. So a shiny object in the scene would have this like blown out flare come from it. I don't. <laughs> like her husband's wedding ring. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. For a totally misplaced sex scene in the first act <laughs> yeah. that like just doesn't do anything. I know. Except show a woman having sex. Mm. Yeah. Like if your sex scene is not doing work, cut it out. Yeah. yeah. Cut it out of your movie. Well, especially, doesn't he kill himself immediately after that? Wow. I know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> this horrible. must have been really bad. Mm. He, she describes it as good, but I guess he had a different opinion. <laughs> well, clearly. Mm. And usually guys aren't all that fussy, let's be honest. <laughs> but something must have gone horribly wrong there because he just oh rolled over and blew his brains out. Oh <laughs> So no. dark. <laughs> this movie is so dark. Jesus. This is what it does to us. Oh, that's oh. terrible. I didn't even think of that until just then. <laughs> Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Mobley Awards. It's the Mobley Awards. Let's get hypnotised. Reach into our suppressed memories to uncover our favourite static footage parts of the film in a number of strangely blue-lit flashback categories. Best quote! There's so many laughable quotes. <laughs> but I think probably my favourite is where she's referencing the amount of people who have been abducted in the US is 11 million. And then she goes, that would win any court case. <laughs> it just... Really tripped me. Oh, yeah. that was a great line. <laughs> <laughs> She's imagining 11 million people testifying in a court case. <laughs> About being abducted by aliens. <laughs> of course. <laughs> the court case of what? The court case of... The people versus <laughs> little grey men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my... Well, my favourite is from my favourite character, Sheriff August Thompson. And at one point in the movie, in the hospital, I think, at the end of the movie, he says, you can't just stop being insane when you want to. That's the sort of thing that stays with you forever. Never a truer word spoken. <laughs> <laughs> it's just terrible script writing. It is, yeah. Terrible. It's one of those things where there's a sentence and you think, well, that's a terrible and stupid sentence. And then there's another one that really doubles down. <laughs> <laughs> and just when you think it's over, there's a cherry on top with forever. <laughs> no. Best hair or costume. Abigail, the VHS version, is the worst dressed character, is the oh. worst and simultaneously best dressed character of this whole feature film. Sure. There's one point where she's being abducted and she's just in some sweats, and I was like, you know what? I feel that. Like, <laughs> it was, it's great. Everybody's in sweats you know, these days. That's, that's yeah. where we live. Time to relax, you know? <laughs> I was going to give a shout out to Elias Cotius's lovely grey checked flat cap that he wears during oh, the movie. Yes. Yeah, or a cheese cutter, I believe you call them in New Zealand. Which yeah, is a we do call them cheese Bizarre cutters. term. Why? I don't <laughs> do you... know. I don't know. <laughs> Most naughty's moment. I would say the flashbacks. Uh, and mm -hmm. Conrad, you mentioned it with the let's just make this flashback really obnoxious we'll turn the volume <laughs> right up we'll have a million cuts in one second i think of movies like saw mm. and a lot of those kind of torture porn films of the 2000s just oh just irritating really 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 frustrating to watch and like it, it's like being punched in the face for like three seconds and then going okay we're well, back back to the film <laughs> but yeah. yeah those flashbacks terrible yes they are i was going to say the shaky cam in general this because uh, it it yeah. just seems like such a naughty thing mm. it's not as obnoxious as in NYPD Blue, if anybody used to watch that. The thing that used to piss me off about that is that they were clearly on sticks in that show. It was on a tripod, but they would just sort of adjust it, sort of slightly left or right at the end of every shot. So oh. you'd cut to someone, they'd say something in this tense interrogation scene, and right at the end of their shot, when they'd finished their line, the camera would just go, 
and just scoot slightly to the left or the right. And it would just keep doing it. And once you notice it Mm. in an episode, that's all you can see for the whole episode. Right. Yeah. Okay. Shaky cam, whenever it gets tense, take it off the tripod, kick the tripod back in the van, start shaking that camera around. (laughs) And Isaac. I would say that this was really prevalent in like the 2000s was super speed up footage and or super slow it down in those sequences as well it's always so obnoxious yes. when you have shaky cam but it's not just shaky cam it's high speed mm. shaky cam so it's like triple the shake oh my gosh <laughs> and that was all over the odds so i would say that's my my moment yeah mm. <laughs> yeah most cliche sci-fi moment I would say it would be using hypnosis to create scenes of revelation yes. and danger. Yeah. I think yes. it's <laughs> second only to seances. I think you get hypnosis in sci-fi and you get seances in horror. But <laughs> it's, it's basically the same scene. Somebody just goes into a trance and says weird shit and it scares the hell out of you and then they scream at some point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Happy anniversary hypnosis in film because it's been part of the genre since the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1920. So it's exactly a hundred years ago of cinema. Oh, wow. Where we've had hypnosis in horror. That's nice. (laughs) (laughs) Nice little fact right there. Yeah. So it's an old cliche. It's a really good vintage. (laughs) Good vintage. That gets better with age. Yeah. Vintage. I mean, I don't know if this movie proves that. (laughs) No, No, possibly not. One thing that really irks me with a lot of horror movies is the solution to a problem is solved by a book that you just happen to be reading that happens to have the contact details of the author that answers all (laughs) of your questions. And that happens... So much in horror. So much. Favorite scene! Let's be honest. I don't have one. (laughs) I don't have one. Uh, Do you have a worse scene? (laughs) Oh. Well, I think probably uh, one of the things I would say is that in the hospital scene at the end of the movie, they play a greatest hits of all of the scariest moments of the film and at that point you realise that you'd gone through 90 minutes and you hadn't really some, you know, added up to much at all really to sort of two or three shots of levitating and shrieking ancient Sumerian and Mm. that was it, sort of six seconds in total so you could just watch that scene and you've got the movie, I think that's kind of the (laughs) angle I'm going for (laughs) How about you, Isaac? What was your favourite or worst scene in the film? I would say that it is the scene where the man holds his family hostage. I mean, because it's just a cavalcade of everything this movie represents. It's like a little insensitive. It's hyper, you know, the most melodramatic it could possibly be. Confusing performances. I mean, that (laughs) scene represents what the fourth kind is. And I don't like the fourth kind because it's good i like it because it's befuddling i like it because it's <laughs> incredibly yeah. confusing and you know there's a warm spot in my heart because of that little bit of confusion the whole like bonding through trauma that anyone who's seen this movie will get you know <laughs> i mean it's definitely the scene that i think of when i think of this movie so sure that. sure 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 yeah. <laughs> favorite <laughs> special <laughs> effect I think favorite special effect is the first back break. <laughs> the first levitation back break. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would say it's yes. not good, just like everything else in this movie, but I would say out of <laughs> all of the scenes in this movie, it's the one that I found the most convincing and was the one that gave me the most like pause as far as effects go. So mm. yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, that's the only scene that sort of sticks in my head as something that I thought was pretty effective. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, my favourite effect was actually a very small moment, and it's it's the only I, can, I guess glimpse of showing the alien. It's one of the reenactment scenes, so it's not even real anyway. I mean, the real footage isn't real, but it's it's when she's under hypnosis and she's recalling the events, and then you see her in bed, and then the door opens, and then all of these really creepy as shadowy figures just pile on in, and like, I I thought that was actually 
really creepy and really disturbing.、Oh. Uh, and I kind of liked it. I kind of,、yeah. you know, it showed enough for it to be like, oh wow, that's disturbing, without sh- like literally just showing a whole bunch of like green aliens walks into the room, because <laughs> that would have killed the movie if they did that. So、yeah. I appreciated the restraint at the same time of being slightly terrifying. Best sound effect. I think the only thing I can really think of is the Sumerian voices. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's quite unexpected and jolting and inhuman, without being obviously electronic, and it's distorted and、mm. strange. It's quite eerie the first time you hear it. I thought、mm. it was quite good the way that they did that, but the rest of it I just thought was sort of kind of brash and <laughs> unnecessary. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I didn't. I wasn't big on the sound design in this movie at all. Have a yeah, Zach. No, I agree with literally every single word. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a detail you liked, Dan? My favorite—it's not a sound effect, but it's a sound technique. It's—it's、uh, it's something that's used in all, mainly action movies, but horror to some extent in sci-fi.、Uh, it's what I what I call like a sonic black hole,、um, and it's before you get. You've got a crescendo to a you know a impact sound or some sort of big moment, and you're crescendoing in volume, and then right before the moment, you cut out all the sound, and so you have like a moment of like a palate cleanse of audio where there's like silence, and then bang, you have the the thing that happens. And I thought they they used it kind of well in in like two of the scenes. I think they were both the hypnosis scenes. The one was Scott, and he's on the couch, and he's making all these really disturbing guttural noises.、Yeah. It's really ramping up the sound, and the music is just like almost there. And then just before it happens, it cuts to black, and then no sound. And then he wakes up, and it's—I don't know—it was really effective that that one moment in particular. And it's the only thing I can really commend with sound in this film. In this film. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like that effect. I think it was—it's quite well used in movies where they go to a complete black hole for a very long period of time as well. I like、mm. it when they do that, like in the Last Jedi, where it goes completely silent while you're looking at all this destruction in space. And... Yeah, action movies, all the time. Like when you realize that they use it, it's like, oh wow. <laughs> Just before any car crash, there's always that little split second of silence. Any time someone crashes through a building, it's always they always show the shot of the other side of the wall and silence, and then the car crashes through it. It's、uh, mm. yeah, it's used a lot. Mission Impossible、it、movies、is. use it really well. Like、mm. they do it、yeah. very very well. Most funniest scene. I hate to say it, but this movie got me right from the get-go with funniest scene. Oh yeah! As soon as Mila Jovovich emerged from the woods, glowing, <laughs> and I was waiting for her to say, "I bring you peace." <laughs> <laughs> but instead, she says, "I am actress Mila Jovovich." I thought, not the actress or an actress. She is actress Mila Jovovich. I was wondering if is this the way she introduces herself generally? <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, I kind of laughed at that point, and <laughs> it didn't get better from there. Sorry. <laughs> But and Dan. <laughs> well, what would I say was one one of the funniest、uh, parts of the movie is is when I think it's Abby and、uh, yeah her colleague Abel I think his name was.、Um, Are talking about like the ancient Sumerian, blah 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 blah, <laughs> and then she says, "Well, whatever it is, it sounds aggressive." And I just thought, <laughs> <laughs> "Is is that your scientific like <laughs> criticisms of this professional opinion?" <laughs> It just sounds aggressive. It sounds I, I don't like his tone. <laughs> I don't like his tone. I don't like his tone. <laughs> oh boy, it's just yet another shining example of professionalism in this movie. <laughs> And that's our movies. Yeah, that is. <laughs> <God> . <laughs>
final verdict time. Should the fourth kind be released from the little Alaskan town of Nome to tell its real, true events, genuine story to all? <laughs> or should it be locked away with other found footage and buried in the deepest corner of the oubliette, never to be spoken of again? Isaac, your favourite <laughs> film? <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so (laughs) when I suggested this for the podcast, I had not seen this movie in a decade, (laughs) maybe, you know, still even when watching it, I do, there is a weird fondness for it. I think it's probably in part nostalgia, but there is no way on God's green earth that I can, (laughs) as a sentient being, let this one out of the oubliette. It needs to stay away. People should stay away from it. Unless you are desperate for some, if you just really want to learn from someone else's mistake, then you can drudge it out. (laughs) But, But otherwise, you know, for general entertainment purposes, yeah, it's gotta be a no from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I strongly despise this movie. <laughs> strongly. I've never had such a discontented experience with a film. Every single scene in this movie irritated me. And yeah, <laughs> I think this is a prime example of what not to do with a film. So, yeah, (laughs) would not recommend this unless you want to take notes of what not to do. (laughs) Yeah, I would agree with that. Let's face it. Let's count out the ways. The script is bad. The dialogue is terrible. The story makes no sense. The approach doesn't work. And the end result is not only unentertaining, it's actually irritating. Like, it's one of those movies where I was shouting at the screen towards the end because it was so stupid. It is genuinely frustrating. (laughs) Yes, the antics of the sheriff. Just, no. If you want to be really, really annoyed, watch this movie... (laughs) But other than that, no, honestly, I I think it should be carried away in a bright light and anally probed for all eternity, (laughs) frankly. (laughs) What a fate. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) So, so, goodbye, fourth kind. Up you go into that beam of light. No, down into the depths of darkness, please. Oh, yeah, that's true. One or the other. Whichever okay. one gets it away faster. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> okay, I'm going to open the trapdoor and throw this damn thing back in there. I'm not just the down you go! <laughs> it's been a while since we've thrown a movie back in the oubliette, so... Yeah. It was super fun discussing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever laughed so hard. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Sometimes you just need it. Sometimes you need a fourth kind in your life. It's a spice of life. Yeah. <laughs> you know? How would you yeah, know the good yeah. if you didn't know the bad? So... Exactly. I'm ex- well, I was excited to bring this one to y'all. <laughs> yeah. So it's been amazing having you here again. We haven't laughed so hard in a very long time, and we need laughter so it's good. So thanks for joining us again, Isaac. Where can people follow your adventures and keep up on your opinions on movies particularly? So I have a blog, www.isaaclastname.com slash blog, where I post movie reviews and just general thoughts on entertainment and stuff like that. You can also shoot me on shoot me on <laughs> you can follow me on twitter <laughs> you can follow me on twitter like a normal person would <laughs> that's also at isaac last name and yeah thank you guys so much for having me on this is a true pleasure as always yeah it's been great having you back isaac yes it's always a pleasure to speak with you so conrad what are we doing next time Well, we've been doing sci-fi an awful lot recently in fantasy, so I thought we need balls-to-the-wall horror for our next episode. (laughs) Oh, yes? So I was thinking we might take a look at a film we've never seen before, the 1989 American slasher film... Intruder. Ew. So we both haven't seen this film. No. So it's going to be a... Double blind. 
love that jingle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Double Blind Special. It's something I've always wanted to watch. It's directed by Scott Spiegel, produced by Lawrence Bender and Sam Raimi. Oh. And it stars loads of people who are tied up in the whole Evil Dead universe. Bruce Campbell is in there. Right. And Dan Hicks, who is in Evil Dead too. I think Sam and his brother Ted pop up in there. So I've never seen it, always wanted to see it. So I'm looking forward to that. Yay for balls to the wall horror. Yes. We need some, I think. <laughs> and if you listeners want to keep track of our future episodes, you can follow us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as Movie Oubliette. Yes, indeed. And if you'd like to sponsor the show, please head on over to Patreon, where for a dollar you can nominate and vote on films for us to cover in future episodes. And for five dollars, you get access to lots of bonus material, extended pieces and unedited versions of our interviews with guests and so on. So, yeah, it's great stuff. It is all fantastic, isn't it, Conrad? And... Please, if you do want to email us as well, we are movie.oubliet at gmail.com. And of course, we love hearing from you and tell us what you think. And even if you don't agree with us, we want to know. Yes, especially on the fourth kind, which <laughs> we, well, I think we were fairly unanimous in our loathing. <laughs> but maybe, maybe we are wrong. Maybe we are the only three people in the world that dislike this movie. Yeah. Tell us about your experience of watching it. Yes. Love to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Isaac, for gifting us such a tremendously enjoyable film. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> Can't wait for your next visit. You know what? I'll make sure and pick something a little less difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, listeners, for joining us. Yes. Bye for now, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>